Mr. Mr. for your uh, welcome and opening your remark, and also Professor Mr. for the, for your overall introduction of the program. And the next is the presentation uh, for this to happen. Uh, Mr. Abuli Mar, postdoc researcher on uh, the PG project, means that he will uh, will be our moderator. Dr. Abule, please come to the floor. And may I also thank the request to strictly manage uh, the time of you. Thank you. This presentation will be on the global component of this uh, global uh, analysis. And um, this global team consists of uh, Dr. Kisla from Vassar College, uh, Morgan Hardy from New York University of Abu Dhabi, Postdoc, myself, friends, and Muslat uh, Jim from New York. And there are also two postdocs, one from Argentina, but they are working based in uh, Abu Dhabi, I mean, Pastor uh, College in New York, and also one another Ethiopian. Uh, her name is Gerard Different. They are working tirelessly to um, make uh, this happen. So, uh, without wasting much time, I would like to invite first uh, uh, Dr. Kisela. She is an assistant professor at Pastor College. She had uh, area of interest is most mainly on development economies with focus on gender and employment, mainly on low income countries. So I don't want to say much about um, uh, her, but uh, I would like to invite her to present on the global component of three research findings on meta analysis, gender gap enterprise data, and also gender business policy environment of human enterprises globally. Please uh, come again. I'm excited to be here and to share the research of the team um, today. I'm really excited though to hear the questions and discussions. So as you mentioned, right, the research does not stop here. Um, we feel like we have some really interesting findings, but we're really interested in your own thoughts on where we can go from here. So without further ado, let me get started. So we just want to introduce, as Abule mentioned, the team members. So I'm Dr. Kisla Kiki, I'm at Vassar College, and um, Dr. Morgan Hardy is at New York University in Abu Dhabi, and we've been kind of the research leads on the global component of closing the gender profit gap. We've been working closely with um, Dr. Abule and Dr. Nusrat, and then supported by three amazing um, uh, research associates as well, um, Dinat, Juan Pablo, and Linda. So please acknowledge all of these people. This research definitely could not have happened without everybody's assistance. Okay, so where I'm going to go today in terms of the presentation, and I just want to check the time. I have about 50 minutes. Is that correct? Okay. Um, I'm going to cover three distinct parts, okay? So the first thing I'm going to cover is um, global stylized facts of the gender profit gap. So our team has synthesized a lot of data to try to come up with some global facts about this. The next thing I'm going to present is looking at the research that has been done so far, all of the existing literature on the, the gender profit gap. So this is our systematic meta-analysis of, of existing literature. And then lastly, I'm going to conclude with our findings looking at um, laws and policies from different countries around the world. So we use a data set that encompasses 190 different countries and look at all of the laws and policies that women business owners face. Okay, so that's where we're going today in terms of the three, three outcomes. So to start us off in terms of why, do we, um, why are we interested in the gender profit gap? Um, so understanding, right, the economic empowerment of women is absolutely crucial to any country's path towards development. Um, a, a common phrase is the gender wage gap, right? This is the difference in wages or salaries that men and women get paid. Um, but a common, what we're going to focus on today is what we call the gender profit gap. So this is the average difference in remuneration for men and women who are self-employed. Okay. So in many low and middle income countries, micro-entrepreneurship is often a common and potentially growing form of employment for women. And so we're trying to understand this difference here. So what I'm going to be presenting is not on wage and salary employment, but it's going to be about um, enterprise profits okay? that, we, that we have. So when we 
collaborated first initially with the EA. Um, what really motivated this whole research agenda was this idea that uh, as a body of knowledge, we don't yet know the, the systematic kind of um, size of trends and drivers of the gender profit gap. We know it exists, right, that it exists, but we don't yet know kind of cohesively, right, across many different regions across the world, um, what it potentially looks like. Much of the research that's been done to date on the gender profit gap is really looking at very specific situations, very specific contexts. We don't yet have an understanding globally of what this looks like. So this was really the motivation for this work. So the key kind of findings from the three different components that we've done so far is what we call first the data gap. So when we try to go ahead and find these stylized facts on the size and trends of the, the global profit gap, right, the gender profit gap, we really started to realize that actually there's not data to do this. Okay? There's not the accurate data to actually be able to go and do this at a global level. So we have what we're pointing the data gap, right? We don't yet have data that's truly representative of women-owned enterprises. So we don't have the underlying data to even be able to say what the global gender profit gap is. Okay? The next is what we're calling the research gap. So existing gender research-based enterprise studies focus just mostly on productivity and capital constraints. And they typically just look at profit or sales as outcomes. So there's really a gap as well in terms of the research that's being done to go ahead and study the, um, these enterprises. And then lastly, I'll conclude with the policy environment. So legal barriers um, continue to be hurdles, right, uh, creating a, to, to creating a supportive environment for women-owned enterprises. I will show you the legal hurdles have definitely decreased over time. The data set that we use starts in 1960, and we can show that the legal hurdles are definitely going down over time, but they still exist. So we have these three different parts of, of the research. The data, and then the existing literature, and then the, the laws and the policies. Okay, so let me start first with the data gaps. Okay. So the motivation here was to uh, I'll just talk while you can't see the slides. So the motivation here was we wanted to create a global data set that encompassed both women-owned enterprises and male-owned enterprises. We need both, right, to be able to see what the gender profit gap would be. Okay, so we set, we set out to go ahead and try to do this with the aim to understand what the gaps are. So what we ended up doing is actually just focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. So we synthesized 168 data sets from 43 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to try to look at this gender profit gap. So we, the first thing we do is we just actually, before we even look at the gender profit gap, we look at just gender representation in the data. Okay, so we look at, at we're gonna look at the women-owned enterprise representation in the data. And we're actually gonna show that how many women uh, enterprise owners show up in the data is very, very different depending upon which data sources you use. Okay, so the underlying message of this is that if you really want to understand gender differences, right, we have to make sure that women are actually represented in the data. Okay, so that's the first bullet point here, right? I say we document large differences in WOE. So WOE is the acronym I'm going to use for women-owned enterprises. So for women-owned enterprise representation and gender gaps um, between the most widely available enterprise data. So there's two sources of the most widely available enterprise data. The first is the World Bank Enterprise Surveys. Many of you, many of you in this room are probably very familiar with this, and I'm interested in your thoughts. The second is um, enterprises found via national household level surveys. Okay, and I'll explain in a lot more detail what we do with these household level surveys. Um, so we're going to show that uh, the number of women enterprise owners that you actually find in these data sets is systematically different depending on which data set you're using. And this all has to do with the sampling protocols for these data sets, okay, of like who they're supposed to include. Um, and so we, we go ahead and we document this and then the question is, okay, but why does this matter, right? This matters deeply because what you, what you say, um, 
is the policy relevant, right? What are the barriers that are facing these enterprises? Really depends on which data set you're using, right? Um, so the different data sources lead to important differences in implied business needs. So if there's trying to be some sort of policy prescription, it really, the policy prescription is going to be different depending on which data you use. Okay, so clarifying takeaway here. I want to be clear that all the data that we use in this, in this um, analysis is very helpful, right? It's very helpful. Um, and in particular, I want to point out that the World Bank Enterprise Surveys, right, are not unique in their underrepresentation of women. Okay, so we find that the World Bank Enterprise Surveys have lower representation of women compared to enterprises that we find via the household surveys. This is not unique, so I will also show you an example from the Ethiopian Manufacturing Census um, that shows the same thing. But I want to be clear, because um, the policy recommendations for this, right, are really to those that are potentially collecting data. None of this data was designed to specifically analyze gender, right? Gender has become an increasing um, category of interest, right? An increasing dimension of interest to people, but these data were never designed to explicitly uh, analyze gender. Nonetheless, though, um, these data sources, particularly the World Bank Enterprise Survey, are used to make policy recommendations on gender, right? They are used, okay? Um, so our, our clarifying takeaway that I have here, and the third point, the, the bolded point, right, is that um, insights derived from the most commonly available enterprise data sources may or actually be more reflective of your average male owner's experience compared to your average female own, enterprise owner's experience. Okay? So it's really this message about understanding who's in the data so that we can uh, make the appropriate policy recommendations. Okay, so just quickly going into the details of the data sources that we're using. So many of you are probably very familiar with this data. So the World Bank Enterprise Survey actually conducts three different types of surveys. Okay, all of these are conducted in metropolitan areas. The first is the um, what we call the WBS regular. This is the most commonly collected enterprise survey. So this is formal firms that have five or more employees. Okay, uh, the World Bank also collects the micro enterprise survey. So this is also formal firms, right? So they're formal registered firms that have less than five employees. And then the infrequently collected um, third survey is the informal firm survey, right? Where you're not a formally registered firm, uh, but you have to be visible. So the enumerators walking down the street need to be able to visibly see your business, okay? And that one is independent of the number of employees. Um, so key variables that we use from this data set, so remember for, for this data, we're going to synthesize this data for 43 different countries. We synthesize 168 data sets over these 43 countries. So the key variables that we think about is if there's at least one female owner of the enterprise. Okay? I can go into a lot more detail as well about these different variable constructions and alternate ways to do this. And then also the sales ratio. Okay, something that also became apparent when we set out to do this research, um, these common collected enterprise data do not have information on profits. Okay, so sales is going to be the, the best we can do in terms of comparing an outcome of a business, a uh, female-owned business to a male-owned business. Okay, so we look at the sales ratio. The next thing that we use is these multi-topic household surveys. Okay, so these are household surveys that are representative of a whole country, right? And many of you have probably used these as well. So many of these have actually survey modules on non-agricultural um, enterprises, right? That are associated with the household. So basically what we do is we take this data and instead of having it at the household level, we flip it to now be at the enterprise level. So we now create a list of enterprises that are associated with a country, right? <clears throat> Um, that we find via this data. So we link all of the enterprises back to the owner so we can get the gender of the owner of the enterprise and also the enterprise information um, if it's uh, the sales and then also where they're located, urban or rural. Okay, so I'm going to show you a series of pictures. These are scatter plots of what we're graphing here. So on the x-axis is time, okay? So we're going to use data post-2005. 
Um, on the y-axis is if uh, there's at least one female owner for the firm, okay? So each point here, so this is a scatter plot, so each point here is a data source, right? So for example, in 2009, you can see there's a point GHA for Jana, right? Um, so in 2009, this is for the household surveys, so this is for all enterprises that are found via the household surveys. Right? What we're graphing here is the average um, women enterprise ownership. Right? So you can read the y-axis is like the percent of the enterprises that have at least one female owner. Okay? So you can see for enterprises found via the household, right, around 60% on average, 57% on average have a female owner. Okay? Now I'm going to compare this to if I look at the World Bank Enterprise Survey data. Okay, so this is, I'm just going to show you the, the pictures here for the regular World Bank Enterprise Survey data. I'm happy to talk about the micro and informal um, later. But the first thing you can see here is there's a lot more data points. Okay, so there's a lot more points. So there's a lot more data collected from the World Bank Enterprise Survey, the regular one. The second thing that you can see is that the average is going to be lower. So if you look at the World Bank Enterprise Surveys, the enterprises uh, found via that survey, have a, only on average about 27% of them have a female owner. Okay, so we find lower female ownership representation using the World Bank Enterprise Surveys. Okay, I'm not going to show you all the equations for the regressions. Um, trust me that we did. I'm not happy to show the paper. Okay, I'm going to show you some coefficient plots that's, that's going to um, map out the point estimates from the regressions. Okay, so what I'm showing here, the red line, is the average um, female ownership representation for um, data found via the household, so from enterprises found via the household, and then you can see the point estimates for the WBS regular, the WBS micro, and the WBS informal. Okay, so the, the key takeaway here is that there are fewer enterprises that are owned by women if you look at the WBES data, right? If you look at enterprises found via the household, you find systematically higher female ownership. Okay, that's the big takeaway here. Okay. I can also show this using the um, Ethiopian manufacturing surveys. Okay, um, so many of you are probably very familiar with this data as well, right? So this is the manufacturing firms in Ethiopia. Um, the sampling protocol for this is that you have to have ten or more employees, um, and it has to be power-operated machinery. So what I'm trying to show you here um, in the different kind of color. Uh, bar, bar here is the manufacturing census is in the, the darkest gray, and then I have the WBES looking at only manufacturing firms in the light gray, and the white is the WBES for all firms. So what I'm showing you here is actually in the Ethiopian case, looking at the manufacturing census, you actually you find similar levels of female ownership to the WBES data. Okay? We think a lot of this, right, has to do with the sampling protocol, right? So to even make it into the Ethiopian manufacturing census, you have to be a formal firm and have 10 or more employees. Okay, so the key takeaways, right, is that the World Bank Enterprise Survey data yields systematically lower women-owned enterprise representation um, compared to estimates uh, obtained from the household surveys, right? Um, using regression analysis, we're able to put in year fixed effects, country fixed effects, all sort of different characteristics, and I can tell you that that's not what's driving it, right? It's not, it's not the fact that there's something unique about Ethiopia or unique about Ghana. That's not what's driving it. Um, and I showed you, right, this, this gap is not unique to the World Bank Enterprise Survey, but it's also seen with other surveys that have similar sampling protocols, right? Similar kind of restrictions on who even makes it in the data. Okay, next, moving to sales. So this is our, um, uh, what we can do, remember, so there's no profit in this data that I can compare across time, so I'm going to use sales. So this is a similar scatter plot, right? So I have X on the time axis, or sorry, excuse me, X. On the X axis is time, right? Each point is a data source, and the Y axis now is going to be the female to male um, sales ratio, okay? So if the Y axis was one, that would mean that on average from a data source, women-owned enterprises have the same sales as male-owned enterprises. 
Okay, so this is a, just a, a ratio here of the y-axis. So here you can see from the household um, data, so enterprises found via the household, the, the sales ratio is on average about 60%, an average of 0.59, right? So on average, women-owned enterprises make about 60% in sales compared to male-owned enterprises. Now looking at the figure, if I use the WBES regular data, again, right, you can see there's a lot more points, we have a lot more data. Right? You can also see that there's a lot more variation. Right? In fact, for some of these countries, for some of the years, the sales ratio is actually over one. Right? So a sales ratio of over one means that on average, women-owned enterprises are earning more in terms of sale than their male-owned enterprises. Okay? So on average, this hovers around 91% if I average all the countries in all the years. Okay, so this is, this is again, just a, a coefficient plot to show you that. So the red line is the um, a sales ratio found for the household surveys, right? Enterprises found via the household surveys, and then I can look at the WBS regular, micro, and informal. We do find that the informal one is similar to the enterprises found via the households. Okay, so the key takeaway here, right, is that male and Female and male businesses in the WBS regular and WBS micro report almost equal sales, right? So if you were just to look at a gender gap and you only use the WBS regular or the WBS micro data, there is no gender gap, right? It's very close to one. You don't see a gender gap, okay? In contrast, if you look at enterprises found via the households, you're going to find a substantial gender gap, right? Here you see a gender gap or a ratio of 0.59. Okay. Again, the regression analysis is all kind of inclusive of your fixed effects and country fixed effects to account for any unobserved differences. Okay, the big question is, okay, why, right? So we can document these stylized facts, and then the question is why? Why would we see this? So um, what we do in the, in the paper and in the, in the um, reports that we've written, right, is we go ahead and we really look at the different sampling frames. Right? So we think much of this is driven by who is even making it into the data, right? which is all a question of the sampling frames. So using the household survey data, right, we're going to compare enterprises that match the sampling frame characteristics of the WBES sampling frames. So if they match the WBES micro or the WBES informal, right? so just as a reminder, the WBES micro sampling frame is you had to be a formal firm with less than five employees, and the WBES informal sampling firm was you were an informal firm but you're visible, right? And a numerator can walk down the street and visibly see your business. Okay, um, I will note, right, that enterprises that satisfy the criteria of the WBES regular, which is you have uh, your formal, but you have five or more employees, is so small. It's very, very small um, in the enterprises that are found via the household. So we're not able to do analysis on them. So let me just kind of skip along for time here. The key, key drivers, what we find is the key drivers, we really think that the formality requirement of the WBS microsurvey is driving much of this gender difference. And for the informal survey, we think that there's this implicit visibility requirement, right, that is driving the difference. So as I mentioned, for the informal, for the WBS informal, the enumerators need to be able to see the business outside of the household, okay? We do not think that it's likely due to the WABS's focus in urban areas. We think that you would find similar, similar findings in rural areas as well. Okay. Um, let me just show you here in terms of um, the sampling factors that are driving the sales gap, right? So on average, we see in the data that women-owned enterprises have lower sales compared to male-owned enterprises. However, right, the women-owned enterprises that actually meet the sampling criteria of WBS micro, right, um, or WBS informal are more positively selective on performance compared to their male counterparts, right? So if you have a women-owned enterprise that is formal, right, and has between one and five employees, we actually see that her sales, right, the, the sales from that enterprise look very, very similar to the sales for an enterprise that's owned by a man, 
right? So um, all this is to say is that women-owned enterprises that meet the sampling criteria of the WBES sampling frames look more like male-owned enterprises, but they are not representative of the average female-owned enterprise, right? The average female-owned enterprise is not, is not um, uh, seen in there. Okay, so why does this all matter, right? So we've documented that there's lower representation and that the sales gaps are gonna be different. Why does this matter? Because if you're using these data sources, right, to think about, well, what are the policy needs of these enterprises, you're going to get very different answers depending upon which data you're using, okay? So what we do is in these surveys, they actually ask questions about what are the, the barriers that your enterprise is facing. And so we study these implied resource priorities using the constraints that are listed. We're gonna we go through this kind of technical component where we go ahead and standardize everything and really think carefully about how they're asking questions. And so we group this into eight broad categories that uh, enterprises can face. They can face market issues, they can face infrastructure issues, capital issues, governance issues, safety, technology, labor, and land. Okay? And from those different categories, we're going to con con construct, right, one kind of prep or one sort of um, number between zero and one for each category so we can understand where their, their needs lie. And so what we find, right, is that the implied enterprise um, focused policy and research priorities are different across these different sources. So if you only looked at the World Bank Enterprise Survey, you would think that the enterprises, what they really, really is holding them back is governance and safety issues, okay? If you look at enterprises found via the household, what you would think is holding them back, what's constraining them, is market access and infrastructure, right? So this is just an example to say that we need to be really careful when we're looking at data and kind of like making policy recommendations about who's in that data because it's gonna have very different implications for what, what people are caring about, okay? I will say as well uh, that there's, um, the differences are driven both by the difference in sampling protocol, but also in the differences in how questions are asked, okay? So it's also, um, there's different ways that these surveys ask questions and then there's differences in who's actually in the surveys. So we go through this kind of technical component of the, of the report and we show that it's actually driven by both. Okay, so just to recap, right, this is the first part of the global analysis um, component that we've looked at, and this has been kind of the, the data part on women-owned enterprise representation. And so our recap is, right, in order for evidence to effectively drive equity-focused policies and research, it's necessary to have data that accurately represents our society. Okay, the project component highlights the importance of considering representation and sampling protocols of common data sources. So we've looked at here the, the um, kind of example of enterprises in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we don't think that this is limited, right, just to, just to this context. Okay, so where do we go from here? So all of us typically fall into to three categories, and maybe we fall into multiple categories at the same time, right, it's not exclusive. So for data collectors, right, the real takeaway is that your sampling and measurement decisions can have big consequences, right? It has big consequences for the usefulness of, say, looking at gender within the data, okay? You need to be aware of who you're actually including in the data. For data users, for those of us that use data, kind of as secondary users, right? You need to be mindful of the sampling and measurement decisions that are made by the, by the data collectors and what implications that has, right? for the, the appropriateness of that data source to the research question, right? The, the bottom line is, is the data source, right, appropriate for the research question? And then also for knowledge consumers, right, for all of us that kind of read research and, and synthesize research, right, we need to be mindful of who is represented in existing data and literature and what this means for our understanding of society and behavior. Okay. And the time. Okay, so moving on to project component number two. So the second thing we did is we did a meta-analysis of all existing literature on enterprises that tend to look at a gender difference. Okay, so the, <clears throat> our goal with this project component, right, was to collect all relevant existing knowledge and, and highlight key knowledge gaps 
to efficiently direct future research on the gender profit gap. Okay, so here what we're going to be doing is actually just looking at published papers that have been published on enterprises and gender. So what do we do? We conduct a systematic meta-analysis comparing existing literature to conceptually derived framework of constraints and outcomes. Okay? Um, what we do is we identify and analyze 115 studies that have gender comparisons and different enterprise outcomes. Okay? We're going to show that the majority of the work is actually going to be looking at um, capital and productivity constraints, what, what is holding these enterprises back. This is all despite the fact that there's this very strong theoretical importance on market and entry constraints, and also looking at non-economic business outcomes. All of this has received much less attention in the current research, right? So, so the bottom line that we're saying here is there's a current body of literature, right, that's really focused on productivity and capital constraints when it comes to the gender profit gap, right? There's a lot more research that needs to be done when looking at market access um, um, issues, right? Okay, so the conceptual framework. So we, we really drive this research with the idea that firms are maximizing profit, right? So all of you, I'm sure, have seen this equation before. Before, this is just a very simple, standard profit maximizing equation. And what we do here is we use this as a motivation for the categories of the different types of constraints that businesses can face, right? So. <clears throat> Businesses can face constraints because of capital, right, which is capital K, potential differences and constraints into these five major categories. So capital is a engine, labor is a category, productivity is a category, market is a category, and entry constraints, right? So when thinking about the gender profit gap, there could be really five constraint categories for reasons or drivers of the gender profit gap. Okay, so this is just our theoretical um, framework. Then, right, so we want to think of the outcome variables that existing research has focused on, right? Thinking of like how are they measuring um, how enterprises are doing. So we're going to classify these business measures into three major groups. One is firm performance, so this is looking at financial performance, right? Looking at sales, looking at revenue, looking at profit, etc. Okay, non-financial firm performance and subjective performance. And then also looking at firm input factors. Thank you. Um, and then thirdly, looking at subjective um, well-being of the owner. Okay, so those are our three um, categories for the outcomes, right, that research has focused on. So research has focused on five different types of constraints of what is potentially holding back uh, women enterprise owners when thinking about the gender profit gap. And these are the different ways in which they're measuring how a firm is doing. Oops, sorry, wrong computer. Okay, so um, we use a, a systematic, uh, multi-stage sampling methodology here to go ahead and actually find all of this research. Okay, so this was quite an involved process. Um, so what we did is we actually pulled all available online articles from the top 500 journals. Um, and then we're going to flag right, different papers in all of these journals um, based upon keywords. So we're really interested right, in um, enterprise work that has a gender component. So firstly, we flag all of the research that has enterprise keywords in the title or abstract. And then we're going to further kind of flag gender words that, um, to see if they focus on gender studies. Right? And then lastly, the fourth thing we do is for a specific research paper, we're going to identify whether or not it's a theoretical paper or it's an empirical paper. Okay? What we're, we're really interested in is more empirical research. Here's just a quick um, sampling tree to show you kind of the, the breadth and the scope of um, how this uh, particular component has done. So the very top node there, you can see is enterprise level studies. So we initially downloaded and scraped 109,000 studies, okay, to go ahead and look at this, right? And then from those studies, we're able to pull keywords from the titles and the abstracts, okay? I won't go through the rest of the sampling tree, but basically what we're looking for is we're looking for studies that had to deal with enterprise, and they had to deal with gender, and then we also are focusing on empirical ones that are in specific regions. 
So what we ended up doing is we identified approximately 3,000 empirical gender-based enterprise studies across regions and income groups over time. What I want to show you here in this bar graph is that the vast majority of this research is done in high-income countries. Okay, It's done in high-income country contexts. So that's what I'm showing you here. On the left-hand side is the number of studies in high-income country contexts over time. You can see um, low-income country context is very, very small right, compared to the high-income country context in terms of the number of studies. For our final sample, what we're going to do is we selected 354 articles. Um, we're going to focus on low and middle income countries, right? We then kind of did a preliminary read of those to see if it had a true gender-based comparison. Our final sample for this meta-analysis is 115 articles that have the gender-based comparisons. Um, today's analysis that I'm showing you is on a random sample of that 115. We're still finishing reading some of them. So the key findings from this meta-analysis, right, is that the majority of the existing gender-based enterprise um, studies, right, from low and middle income countries are going to focus on enterprise productivity and capital constraints, right, um, and then look at financial measures of firm performance, right. Market and entry constraints and non-economic business outcomes are not studied. So this is to say that these areas are very ripe for research, right? A lot more work needs to be done to understand entry constraints, um, to understand the market, and then to also look at potentially non-traditional uh, outcomes of how a firm performance is, right? What are other outcomes, say, besides sales, besides profit, that we can focus on? So let me just show you um, a couple of quick pictures that show um, what I just said in words, right? So this is the existing literature. These are the five different um, constraint categories, capital, labor, productivity, market, and entry. And you can see, right, that the vast majority of studies are gonna fo focus on capital and productivity, productivity issues. Just move along. So some outcomes, right, are being much more used than others. So this is also just a bar graph to show you that within the different constraint categories, right, or five different constraint categories, um, there's different outcome measures that are used. So the, the black bar there is going to be our firm performance measures. This is very typically, this is sales um, or profit that they're looking at. So this is the most common way existing research studies are evaluating firm performance, right? Is actually looking at these kind of um, <clears throat> uh, financial financial measures of firm performance. Okay, so um, gender-based comparison of these business outcomes, right, heavily depends on traditional financial performance as indicators. Um, things such as subjective business performance and subjective well-being are far less common. Um, and as I've said before, right, um, capital and productivity are the most commonly studied um, constraint categories. Okay, so what's next? What, is, what does this mean, right? So this means that there's high value in research that can focus on understanding these understudied constraints, right? These understudied constraints such as market access, right, are theoretically very um, potent, right, very prominent, but they haven't received empirical, empirical work. Okay, this is especially true for these micro and small um, enterprises where the definition of success can be context specific and can really vary by the owner's gender. Okay, okay so moving on to the third component of the project. So the, the first component was all about existing data on enterprises. The second component was all about existing research, right, on enterprises. And our third component is really thinking about policies and laws that govern enterprises. Okay, we're going to look at this from a gender angle. So what do we do? We're going to look at the business and policy environment for women-owned enterprises. Um, so one of the reasons, right, that gender-based inequalities and business opportunities um, are different can be because of gender discriminatory laws. Right? So this can threaten women's economic inclusion, safety, career growth, right? Um, and it can hinder the creation of female support of the business environment. So understanding these um, gaps right, in the law and policy environment is important um, to promoting pro-gender research and policy discussion. 
So the data that we use, right, is we're going to use um, the World Bank's Women, Business, and Law data set. I'm going to give it the WBL acronym, right? And from this data, we're going to document a series of stylized facts and uh, about the business and policy environment. So what this data is, is it, it covers 190 countries um, from 1970 to 2020, right? And it's going to measure the equality of economic opportunity under the law between men and women in these different countries for each different year, okay? And we're going to describe law policy changes for 35 legislative issues that may impact women, own, um, women enterprise owners. So I, I have this in gray here, but I think it's important to note, right? Um, this database is amazing. It is not uh, perfect, right? It's not, uh, it doesn't cover everything. So as I say here, right, this does not cover um, legal gender discrimination across all aspects of a woman's life. Um, there definitely can be things that are missing, but to the best of the researcher's ability, it's complete. Okay, so similar to the, um, uh, you know, kind of theoretical framework that we use for the analysis looking at research, I'm going to use that same theoretical framework when looking at the barriers, the policy and law barriers that women face. So I'm going to group these 35 individual le legislative issues into five constraint categories that women-owned enterprises could face. Right? So for example, for under labor, right, any sort of policy or law that constrains women's labor supply. For capital, right, anything that constrains women's access to capital. For example, are there equal property rights in a, in a specific country in a specific year? Looking at productivity, is there anything that constrains women's working productivity? Market access, right, are there any legal barriers to women's market access? And then lastly, entry. So is there anything constraining um, women's entry into employment? Okay. And so from these uh, five categories, right, I'm going to um, create a couple of different indices. Okay. So I'm going to have uh, a barrier indicated level score that's going to range between 0 and 1. And then I'm actually also going to create an aggregate barrier indicator score. Okay, so I'm going to have a, a, a score for each of the five categories and then also an aggregate one for each country. So let me show you the key findings um, before I wrap up. So the key finding is that legal barriers continue to be hurdles um, in creating a supportive economic environment for women, right? Women are going to face a variety of barriers depending upon the region and the income group that they fall into. So the big finding that we find, right, is that on average, barriers facing women-owned enterprises are decreasing over time. Okay, so here is a line graph where on the x-axis I have time, and on the y-axis I have um, the women-owned enterprise barrier score. So it might be a little bit hard to see, but the different um, dashes are representing the five different categories that I have, right? So the, the highest category um, in terms of uh, all of these issues is productivity issues. But you can see for all five categories, it's decreasing over time. Okay, so there's good progress on removing legal barriers that women-owned enterprises have faced in the last five decades, right? However, the pace of the reform varies by category, okay? So productivity has seen the most improvement in terms of removing barriers for women, okay? Um, market access and capital barriers, despite relatively lower initial scores, did not show much improvement over time, right? Okay? So this suggests that countries, right, may just be displaying differing degrees of resistance to granting equal legal rights to women in these different groups in these different categories. Okay, stylized fact number two that I'm showing you here is this is the same graph that I showed on the previous slide, but now it's broken down by different regions of the world, okay? So each sub-figure here is for a different exclusive category of countries, okay? So you can see in category C there is all the OECD countries, okay? And then in category G is actually all the sub-Saharan African countries. So the, the scale on the y-axis is the same for all of these sub-figures, so it's a kind of nice visual representation of how the different areas are comparing over time. 
right? And you can see um, there's large differences, right, in terms of how different regions of the world are progressing in terms of removing some of these barriers that women enterprises face. Okay. Um, so, the, as I just said, the OECD and um, LAC countries are going to show a constant rate of decline in barriers, right? Um, Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Europe and Central Asia are going to show a rapid decline in the barriers, especially in the, two, the early 2000s and onward. Uh, the MENA countries show a much slower decline over time, right? And then, um, I don't have time for it today, but we also look at um, the decline of barriers by different uh, categories of high income versus low income groups as well. Okay, so just to wrap up, because I know I'm out of time, um, the, the primary conclusions, right, from the global component of this work, looking at the gender profit gap, right? The first um, is our globalized stylized facts on the gender profit gap, right, is that we need to be data aware. We need to be aware of the data we're using, okay, to go ahead and even try to look at these issues. So we need to be cautious of the sampling and measurement decisions made by data collectors' implications, right? Um, insights derived from existing data sources on enterprises, right, may be gender biased towards, right, the more um, average male owner's experience versus the average female owner's experience. Okay? And this is because of the sampling decisions, right? So if you require a firm to even get into the enterprise data set to be formal and have five or more employees, systematically you're going to be excluding a lot of women-owned enterprises. The second finding, um, our systematic meta-analysis of existing literature, right? is really highlighting that there's a need for new research to focus on understudied, um, yet theoretically important constraints such as market access. Okay? Lastly, from the global business and policy environment, there's been good progress on removing legal barriers that women-owned enterprises have faced in the last five decades. However, there's room for improvement, right? And that varies regionally as well. Okay, I would like to wrap up there and just say a huge thank you to BEA for collaborating on all of this work and then to the Gates Foundation for supporting this work as well. Um, I'm really excited to hear any questions and feedback and I also welcome any emails um, as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>